And that's uh, Crime on the Waterfront with uh, Mike Wallace starring as uh, Police Detective Lieutenant Lou Cagle of the New York uh, Police Department. And this is a broadcast from February 24th of 1949. And uh, joining us at our studio here in the uh, Museum of Broadcast Communications is our very special guest this afternoon, Mr. Mike Wallace. Thank you, Chuck. You have a lot of fans in the Chicago area, Mike. Oh, well, listen, this is, this is where I grew up professionally, so that I, I have a special feeling about this town. I... I uh, Went to college in Ann Arbor mm -hmm. and got a job. Luckily, I, I couldn't get a couple of jobs for which I had auditioned, and I got a job at WOOD in Grand Rapids back in 1939, and then came to Detroit to WXYZ, and finally here to Chicago in 1941. Did you, was your first job, job here in Chicago as a staff announcer on no, some stations? No, I was freelance. Mm -hmm. I announced a soap opera called Road of Life. The story mm -hmm. of Dr. Jim Brent. <laughs> and Dr. then Brent short call surgery, right? <laughs> that, that's exactly the one. And shortly after that, got a job uh, doing the air edition of the Chicago Sun Times before it was the Sun. Mm -hmm. Those were the days when you could, as you know, Chuck, you could do news and commercials and narration and acting and everything. And no one thought the worst of before it was all honest work. And the extraordinary thing for somebody breaking into the business back then was that it gave you an opportunity to do a variety of chores, and you began to learn what it was that you could do and, and what you couldn't do. And that Lou Cagle, mm -hmm. how long did that stay on the air? Not too long. <laughs> my, my son Chris earlier heard a little uh, bit of the Lou mm -hmm. Cagle, and he said, I understand why you went into news. <laughs> <laughs> you started... On radio in Detroit, actually. In Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids. And mm -hmm. you, you moved to Detroit. Right. And did some work with uh, the Lone Ranger and the Green Hornet? Well, I, uh, I filled in as the narrator on the Lone Ranger mm -hmm. occasionally, mm -hmm. and but announced the Green or narrated the Green Hornet, Ned Jordan's secret agent, Challenge of the Yukon, and along with Douglas Edwards, I was one of the Cunningham news aces. Cunningham Drugstore <laughs> sponsored it, and there was a P-38, <laughs> the Cunningham News Aces on the air, and I was one of the two Cunningham News Aces back So you, you do sound effects, too. <laughs> whatever, whatever paid the bills. <laughs> was it a good time for you? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, come on, you were breaking into mm -hmm. the, the way you wanted to make your living and learning. And I remember you mentioned the Lone Ranger. We were talking about it earlier. There was a stock company of actors in Detroit, of all places, mm -hmm. a stock company of actors who were in all of those radio shows. And if you got a ranger, you really were getting rich because this was before the days of tape or wire recording or even wax recording. So we would have to do three live shows. We played the ranger at 6.30 to the East Coast, 7.30 here in the Middle West, and 10.30 on the West Coast. And you did each of the three things live. And I think that Af AFRA, the American Federation of Radio Artists, by that time had gotten our fee up to 38 bucks for those three shows. Three and shows. that was Bonanza. Mm -hmm. No, it was the Lone Ranger, Bonanza. <laughs> <laughs> I set you up. I'm sorry about that. How did you get from Detroit to Chicago? Um... A friend of mine who had been a sound man and then a director at WXYZ Radio, Ted Robertson, came here to direct soap operas. And he said, Erna Phillips, who was the woman who did uh, Guiding Light and Road of Life and so forth, uh, needed an announcer for one of her soap operas, Road of Life. And P&G was the sponsor for Chipso, C-H-I-P-S-O. The Chipso <laughs> Elephant and the Chipso Lamb or something to, to show how tough and how easy Chipso was as a soap. In any case, she had veto power over the announcer on the soap opera. And what she wanted was somebody who could narrate her soap opera, the heck with the commercials. And so mm -hmm. she, she chose me and, and they, uh, P&G hired me. Can I ask what you were paid? $155 a week because we were, were so funny. I remember all this so well. <laughs> well, of course, you know, I'm, I'm money-oriented. <laughs> uh, uh, 
It was, I think, 112 if it were only um, one show. But we played at 10 o'clock in the morning from 10 to 10.15 on NBC, just mm -hmm. before Vic and Sade. And then we came over to WBBM, to CBS, for the repeat. And so for the two, you got 155 bucks a week. You, were you recording one in between there any place? Sometimes they recorded a show to play where there were no network broadcast. No, not at that you time. No, that's all I was doing. Mm -hmm. That's all I was doing. It, I really used a lot of shoe leather in this town mm -hmm. because that show was canceled after the first year. And I was out of a job. And I mean really out of a job. And I had a son on the way. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have five bucks coming in. So I, I remember so pounding from advertising agency to advertising mm -hmm. agency, auditioning, you know, trying to find a job. And eventually, as everyone does, you catch on. And so by the time I left for the Navy in late 43, early 44, I was doing reasonably well. At that time, I was also doing the air edition of the Chicago Sun-Times, on, uh, actually on a radio station called WJWC, hmm. who was, which was, uh, the call letters were that for a man by the name of John W. Clark, who was a friend of Marshall Field, who owned the Chicago Sun, and you could hear the, the station as far north as South Chicago occasionally. <laughs> the, the, the transmitter was in Hammond or Gary, and then after the war came back, to WMAQ. By that time, it was the, the Sun Times, and I got my job back on the late news mm -hmm. on Q. When you when you were doing that air edition of the Chicago Sun, uh, were you was that a rewrite of the news stories of yep. the day? Yeah. Uh -huh. Clifton Utley was mm -hmm. the editor, mm -hmm. Garrick Utley's dad, mm -hmm. and he was also the head of the Council on Foreign Relations here. And we had a fellow by the name of Joe Fromm, who was his assistant, who wound up as managing editor of the of U.S. News and World Report. Mm -hmm. Bill Costello, who later became a CBS News correspondent. We had a first-rate staff at the Chicago Sun, and we used to broadcast from the top floor of the Daily News building, right down close by here. That's that I think was the original home of WMAQ. Was it? Uh, or MAQ was in the Drake Hotel. That's right. I, that I didn't Somebody know. MAQ was, was in the merchandise market. By the time I, you got there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, they're leaving the merchandise market. I now. hear. That. NBC Chicago is moving to a brand new building. New, I know. Yeah. Uh, Chris pointed it out today. Mm -hmm. I had, had no idea it was such a beautiful yeah. new building. But there's an awful lot of history in that uh, fantastic merchandise market. Oh, I should say so. And I think you made a lot of history over there, didn't you? Well, we all, like, yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I don't know about making a lot of history. We all had a lot of fun mm -hmm. because there were. This was the center, really, of soap operas in America back then, mm -hmm. and and there was a tremendous amount of work to be had. Then, in addition, there were things like uh, um, First Nighter, and Curtain mm -hmm. Time, and Don McNeil's Breakfast Club, and a variety of radio shows, the Knickerbocker Playhouse, things of that nature, and. Uh, Again, it was, it was, then came Dave Garraway and Studs Terkel, mm -hmm. and then Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. All of that came out of the merchandise mart. Well, you were tossing the ball out today at Wrigley Field, and I guess that was a pretty exciting experience. A real isn't kick. It? Isn't yeah. that wonderful to be yeah. out there? I should say so. What were the Cubs doing when you. Uh, left? When we left <laughs> to come here, they were uh, at 2 2, and I understand. What is the score now? Anybody know? Still 2 2? Still 2-2. Two, two. Good. So we haven't missed anything. Uh-uh. <laughs> anyway, while you were, well, you were at Wrigley Field earlier, we were playing a curtain time broadcast uh, where you were doing commercials for Mars Incorporated. Right. And uh, that was a show that, as a youngster, and I'm sorry to say this, but as a youngster, I would go to see once in a while. Oh, I, yeah, I announced I, it as a youngster. That's right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> But I remember that you and all of the other people who appeared on, on that show were dressed for the occasion. You had dinner jackets or tuxedos, and the Correct. women had gowns right. and the whole thing. Radio or not. That's right. There was a catering to the studio audience as well as the listening audience. Well, the studio audience for the Breakfast Club mm -hmm. was fascinating. I mean, we're, we're early in the morning, and they never failed to jam it with mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. But uh, radio... I mean, there was more, how to say, there was more glamour, I guess, is the proper word for radio back then, because mm -hmm. television had barely, barely begun to poke its nose over the horizon. I noticed, by the way, that Bill Eddy, mm -hmm. Commander Eddy, 
who was the originator of WBKB here in town, yes. just died. It just died a, within the last week ago. or so. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. At the Merchandise Mart, when you were with WMAQ, were you on staff then? Never on staff. Never on staff. Mm -mm. No, I I freelanced exclusively here in Chicago. For the I was here for a decade with two two and a half years out maybe, and uh, I worked GN mm -hmm. and Q and BBM. Mostly those three, and it and it just kept you so busy because there was so much activity here in town. Then, did you ever get uh, caught by the bridge being up? Uh, only on one or two occasions, but I did. <laughs> but you <Yeah>. did. <laughs> and didn't. Actually, what happened was I didn't make the repeat at CBS. Mm. I was coming across and and didn't make the repeat of Road of Life, and I thought I was going to lose my job as a result of it. But they understood. That was a standard uh, problem or excuse, I think. A little of each. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. You were telling, you should stopped in the museum earlier this morning, and we talked very briefly about um, the announcer's lounge at WMAQ, right. which was a very interesting place. The announcer's lounge was a room, I would say, it's just a big, big, comfortable room with a lot of leather chairs around it. And when I used to come in for the late news on WMAQ, the air edition of the Chicago Sun-Times, Dave Garraway and Hugh Downs, who were on staff there, each of them, both announcers, and then Garraway would do his, his late-night disc jockey mm -hmm. show that everybody, that really made David's reputation. Anyway, and, and Downs would sit there waiting to do station breaks each night, and they had one of those huge Webster's dictionaries that's on wheels, and they would play a game at a dollar a throw, one would give the other a fellow that he a word that he thought that the other guy could not define, and the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is that Downs knew more than <laughs> than <laughs> Garraway did. But that's what they used to do night after night after night, uh, ev and everybody was persuaded. They knew that Dave Garraway had a fine future, but Downs never make it, never make it, and as you can see, he never <laughs> he made it. Didn't do it, right? <laughs> So somebody said, I, was it you who said this morning that he's he's done more television hours, Hugh? Can I talk television a little sure, bit here? Sure, of course, too? of course. <laughs> than anybody else in America, and I think that I probably have. is mm -hmm. true. Between the Tonight Show and the Home Show and the Today Show and all of the things that he has done through the years. When you were freelancing in Chicago, were, mm -hmm. were you ever tempted to become a staff man someplace? No, no, and and that. It really is a question. I go back to my money orientation. Mm -hmm. When I was out of a job and with a son over the horizon, I really did get very insecure about it. And so I said to myself, listen, never depend upon one job again. I had Road of Life and then I had a little hitchhike announcement for some shampoo, another P&G shampoo uh, that paid $10 a day. Ten dollars a spot, so I was making something like one hundred and ninety-five dollars a week, two hundred and five dollars a week, and I came down to the mailbox. We used to live on North State Parkway one day, and there were cancellation notices on both of those. And I suddenly realized, from making a big fat ten or eleven thousand dollars a year, I was broke, and had about two hundred bucks left, and that really gave me a chill. So I said, "Okay, never again." And that's one of the reasons why I branched out into so many things, trying to find if, if something didn't work, that mm -hmm. I'll go someplace mm -hmm. else in radio. I mean, I wanted to stay in radio, but uh, and that's why I never took a staff job. And I stayed freelance. I went to CBS in New York in 51 mm -hmm. and stayed uh, there for three, four years and then freelanced for a while. And freelance for a long time until I realized that I was the all of us were creatures of 13 week contracts every 13 weeks you could be out of a yeah, job uh -huh. so that's when I said to CBS hey I would love to sign a contract for a steady job and a steady check at a reduced sum just because you want the assurance of being able to pick up a check at the end of the week. There's not a great deal of security in this business uh, no. for most people. No. 
and even for the well-established people. Uh, That's right. Tomorrow something can happen and it's it's over. If you're freelance, mm -hmm. really, you are you're at the at the whim of mm -hmm. the advertising agency, the ratings, the whoever the new mm -hmm. boss is over your show, and it's. Uh, so it's a good idea to head for, I mean, if that's important to you, and it is to most of us, to head for the safe haven of a contract that goes on and on, or a good relationship with a company in broadcasting. I'm Chuck Shaden. Our guest is Mike Wallace. We're um, talking about his career this afternoon, and we've been listening to lots of his broadcasts from the good old days of radio. Um, those were the days from 97 FM. This is WNIB Chicago, WNIZ in Zion. Mike, while you weren't here before, we've been playing all kinds of your dirty laundry on the air today. Oh, my. Uh, we played an excerpt from a program that uh, you and Buff Cobb conducted at the Shea Paris. Mm -hmm. It was called the Shea Show. Right. Now, how did that come about for you? WMAQ. It was on from 11.30 until 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm trying to think how it came about. Um... Probably somebody offered me a job. <laughs> that, that, that is how it came about. But Buff and I were married at mm -hmm. that time, and she had never done any radio. She had never done any television, didn't virtually exist at that time, but she'd never done any radio. And they talked about the possibility there was Tex and Jinx in New York, and mm -hmm. Peter Lynn Hayes, and Mary Healy, his wife, and Dorothy and Dick, Dorothy Kilgallen. And, and so they thought. Why not develop a husband and wife team here in Chicago? And so Q, WMAQ, asked us if we wanted to do it. I said, well, look, if you don't mind hiring a, a, an apprentice, because Buff was. And she was a little bit nervous about it. So we used to drive around Chicago, and I'd say, okay, I am Betty Grable. Ask me ten questions. <laughs> or I am, I mean it. Seriously, mm -hmm. I did. And she would say, da, da, da. And I'd hit her once or twice. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that's really, no, we, and we trained. And what happened was that, you know, you develop a kind mm -hmm. of style. And, and our style was to argue on the air. We bickered. You remember the Bickersons? Mm -hmm. Yes. Who was it? it was Don Amici and Francis Langford. And Francis mm -hmm. Langford on radio. And so we began to bicker on the air, Mike and Buff did. And it was sort of entertaining from 11.30 until 1 o'clock in the morning. And we bickered a lot. And then eventually CBS in New York mm -hmm. heard our bickering and found it interesting. So they brought us into New York to do it. And we bickered ourselves right out of a marriage. It was True. disintegrating right on the air. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, that was, a, that was the forerunner of a lot of the, in Chicago, it was the forerunner of many broadcasts that came from the Shea Prix. Later on, uh, Jack Eigen, Jack Eigen uh, did it, made a career out of it yeah. over there. We did, we did just one year. Mm -hmm. But that was really, again, that was wonderful training. Because we, it was out of the Shea Prix, out of the little bar, I think they mm -hmm. called it the Sapphire Room, to the, to the side of the big room. But all kinds of people, politicians would come mm -hmm. in, and sports figures, and arts figures, and and you you really began to learn about doing research, and and ad living, entertaining mm -hmm. questions, and trying to uh, stir a little heat, if you could, to make it interesting. Exactly, sure. and it was it was a very good background for learning your craft. Was this uh, an early experience for you as far as on-the-air interviewing was concerned? When I got back out of the Navy in 46, uh, the first interview show that I had ever done was Famous Names, which originated out of the Balinese room of the Blackstone Hotel. Mm. It was on WGN. That was really the first one. It was for a half hour every afternoon, Monday through Friday. And the same thing was true there. M mainly, I think, we, we interviewed uh, entertainment figures there, very few politicians. But that helped you to understand the give and take. Also helped me to understand that in order to do an interesting interview, the interviewer really has to know a great deal about the interviewee mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that you can get that person talking. And, and I made no bones about it. I was quite content to write out a lot of my questions ahead of time. And then if you, you can always fall back on the, on the written question mm -hmm. and the, the kind of information that you uh, 
develop in that way and the questions that you develop in that way. Then you can discard them if the interview becomes sufficiently interesting, but you always have that to fall back on. And that truly, to, to this day, is the way that I try to prepare. Get as much information for a 60 Minutes interview and write out maybe 50 questions ahead of time mm -hmm. and then, working from that, let the, let the um, conversation go where it will. But you have, you have that piece of paper there. And what I do is, let's say that you're interviewing a politician. And then I'll do five questions. I'll put a heading at the top of this legal pad. Mm -hmm. uh, power. Five questions. Corruption. Five ambition. Uh, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And maybe get six or seven or eight categories. And use that as a kind of scorecard to keep the thing going. If every interviewer would listen to what you've just said we'd have a lot better interviews along the line on every, in every phase, whether you're doing a, a so-called lightweight interview or a penetrating interview. Yeah. So many interviewers don't listen to what the person they're interviewing is saying, and so many of them don't come prepared with any background or any information. It's, it's well, terrible. The business about not coming prepared is mm -hmm. inexcusable. The business about occasionally not listening as much mm -hmm. as you might, I understand perfectly because... What do you think? You're thinking about the engineer. You're thinking mm -hmm. about the clock. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about the time for the commercial. Mm -hmm. you're, you know, and, you're, and, and you've really got to plant your feet and look your interviewee in the eye and say, okay, it's you and me, and there's nobody else here. Right, right. It was, it was fun, really. Back in, uh, in New York, I used to do a program called Nightbeat, television mm -hmm. uh, program, and it was one of the first of the almost occasionally self-consciously abrasive, warts and all, close-ups and so forth. And in a dark studio with just stabbing Klieg lights in the face of the interviewee. And it was, you knew that you were making it when you, saw, you understood that the person you were interviewing forgot the cameras, forgot the lights, forgot everything, and mm -hmm. the chemistry had been achieved between the two of us. And that's a, it's a wonderful feeling. You've done a, and you don't need me to tell you this, but you've certainly done a marvelous job with the, your career. And uh, we here on our broadcast and the people who listen to this show remember the early days, the Chicago days especially. And when they see you on 60 Minutes or in some other venue where you're performing or doing your thing, mm -hmm. they remember the roots that you have in the Chicago area. And we That's thank nice you for job. that. You've done, a, uh, you, you've done the profession very proud. And, well. Uh, you're to be congratulated on the event tonight, the, the, the uh, salute by this museum for your career and work. Well, this is the first time that I have been in this museum. I went over this morning with Bruce Dumont and took a look at mm -hmm. some of the computers and what you can call up in the way of your 45,000 radio. <laughs> is that true? 48. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a thousand radio shows and all the television shows. Yeah, and it's, yeah. uh, we, have a, we have also, we have a mm -hmm. museum in um, New York. Mm -hmm. I understand mm -hmm. they're putting one together down in Atlanta. And it's about time that we all got together and began to, to, to save and savor and, and use what has taken place in radio and in television uh, you, for... You use it for entertainment. You use it to understand where you came from. There's so much research that can be done and so it, much entertainment that can be had. And it's, it would be a shame to lose any of it. Correct. Uh, with, and with these radio shows, as an example, if they were good back in 1947, they may still be good today. So why shouldn't someone be able to hear them if they'd like to hear them? That's why this museum is here. Of course, the fun of radio, for me, mm -hmm. is exactly what's going on now. I mean, you, can, you really can forget about the lights and the makeup and um, all of that, a lot mm -hmm. of people around. I was astonished when I first started to do television because radio, oh, come on, this is it. Mm -hmm. There's an engineer, there's a director, there's a fellow or oh, two or three people in front of a microphone, and that's it. Yeah. And then suddenly you walk into a television studio and there are 30 people there. <laughs> and it's very, it, yeah. it, it, it was difficult at the beginning to concentrate on the matter at hand, which in the final analysis is what you're saying mm -hmm. into the microphone. I thank you for what you said in the microphone for all these years. Chuck, we thanks. won't forget your radio career. We'll 
certainly savor your television career and hope that uh, it continues for, well, George Burns is going along for a while. I mean, you're a long way from George Burns. Not so long. <laughs> My daughter is smiling over there. <laughs> Your son, Chris, is here. I wonder, Chris, would you just step over to our Those With The Days microphone for just a second? We'd, uh, he's accompanied you here. Um, well, he was born here and, right. and started in Channel 2 here. That is, he started out. He was a print reporter at the Globe after college in Boston and then uh, went to, came here to Channel 2. He used to work for CBS before mm -hmm. he went wrong. <laughs> And you've gone to the network of the Chimes now. Well, no, actually, I went to the network of the Chimes, and uh, in January I switched to ABC. The, the other Chimes. The other Chimes. The backward Chimes, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, what do you think about this uh, event for your dad? You're pretty proud of him, I think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's very exciting because, uh, you know, we we're always thinking in our business about what's next. You know, what's the the, the latest piece you did, the most mm -hmm. recent interview. And to suddenly look back over the body of a career, and it's quite a career, you know, 40 years in broadcasting and radio, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, to look back at, from the radio broadcast through all the years of the quiz shows uh, to the interviews, and now 60 Minutes for 21 years, it's, it's extraordinary. You're pretty proud of your son, too, aren't you? <laughs> I should say I so. so. Yeah. I should say yeah. so. Well, listen, you're bound, you're bound to be proud because your son wants to do the mm -hmm. same thing that you did. And then, and then he's, he's got a... He's done it all on his own. I mentioned before that he, that he used to work for CVS, mm -hmm. and he could still work for CVS, but he decided he wanted to do it absolutely for himself. And well, so you that, have to have some talent to do that, and I know you do, Chris. Well, uh, thank you. And we're glad that you came along, and uh, we're proud of both of you. And uh, Mike, it's... Uh, Great to have you with us. We appreciate it. I know you've been so busy since you came in last night, but we're glad you stopped by with us today. We'll see you tonight at the uh, Hilton. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you very much. Thanks. Chris and Thank Mike Wallace. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. A Mars bar. I just gave Mike Wallace a Mars bar in honor of the old curtain time days. Chuck Shaden on Those Were the Days from 97 FM. Are you ready now for Sky King? Let's go back to July 23rd of 1947 for Sky King.